Right, hello everybody, can you hear me? Merva, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, yes, thanks. Um, so welcome to our guest lecture today. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome Merva from Eco Energy uh, to give this guest lecture. Uh, unfortunately, Stefan can't be at the lecture today, so uh, we recorded a short video in which he briefly introduces Merve. And uh, I will play the video now and hope that you can hear the audio well. And after that, Merve, I will make you a presenter so you can share your slides then. Okay, so I will start um, sharing my screen to show you the short video. Hello, everybody. Um, this is Steffen Hund. Um, yeah, unfortunately, um, I'm unable to attend to this very uh, thrilling presentation which we have today with Eco Energy. But uh, I want to say hello to everybody and uh, especially I want to welcome Merve, which we uh, have today. And it's a great honor to have you in class. Um, and we are yeah, very excited to hear about uh, your opinions and perspectives of one of the major eco labels, eco energy, uh, when it comes to green energy certificates. Um, just a few words about our lecturer today. Um, Merve has a very, very impressive uh, CV. Um, she is one of the three finalists of the EU Sustainable Energy Week Awards for Young Energy Trailblazers. This is uh, the category. Uh, so, from our side, congratulations for this great achievement, Merve. Uh, Merve is with more than five, uh, almost six years uh, in, in eco energy, a very, uh, yeah, an, a very senior, experienced liaison coordinator, especially for the Asian and North African markets. Uh, she has a very impressive uh, uh, university background, having studied in China, having studied uh, in, in, in Turkey and the UK. So several stations we see a very proven, very international academic and practical background. So Merve, thank you that uh, you are supporting our format and I wish everybody a very good um, section and uh, lecture. So um, take the chance to ask questions as much as you can. And um, yeah, you, you can be uh, also happy to have Joanna Jano today with you, um, who is moderating this one um, and, and, uh, yeah, in, in the replacement of myself. Unfortunately, I need to care, take care uh, about uh, personal issues. But uh, I wish you everybody a good day and uh, a good lecture. Bye bye. All right. So I hope you could hear him well. Um, thank you, Merva, again from my side as well for being here today. I will make you a presenter now. One second. So now you should be able to uh, share your screen. Yes, I see the button now. So thank you very much, Johanna. And thank you, Stefan, in your absence <laughs> for uh, your very kind introduction. And uh, thanks for uh, to both of you for inviting me, for having me uh, at this lecture. And um, hello, everyone. I'm sharing my screen right now. So you are going to be able to see my slides very soon. I hope it started right now. Johanna, um, have I started sharing my screen? Yes. Yeah, OK. Um, so yeah, uh, I will get uh, right to the topic because this is exactly what we do at EcoEnergy, the voluntary use of renewable energy. This is what we promote. This is uh, what we, like I wanted to say what we preach, but we don't only preach it, but we also take concrete action and we also encourage others to take action. So I hope it will be relevant for all of you, you know, who will be in this sector or in relevant sectors in the near future. And I want to say uh, right off the bat that this is a very good time because, um, I mean, when we talk about climate change or the obligation, you know, the urgency of climate action, actually, this is not something new. Um, it has been around for decades already, but this is a good time basically for all of you to, uh, you know, start your uh, careers or shift and continue your careers in this sector because it's becoming more and more 
pronounced, more and more highlighted. And uh, right now we see a lot of developments taking place. In the beginning, it was, you know, a lot of interest, a lot of, let's say, like curiosity and, you know, different market players were exploring around. But right now things are actually happening. So and that is exactly one of the topics I want to talk about. So here you see my name and my email address. So, um, by the way, I want to say, so if you have any questions while I am speaking, uh, don't hesitate to write them uh, on the chat box. And if you feel comfortable, you can also unmute yourself and you can ask your question, but you can write them on the chat box. And I want to ask Johanna to let me know because right now I'm looking at my slides, so I may not, I mean, I will look at the chat box from time to time, but in case I miss, uh, Johanna can remind me like there is a question and then I will be very happy to answer. But also after my presentation, there will also be time for a Q&A. So you can also ask your questions there, but if you have any burning questions that you want to ask, you know, right Right in the very moment uh, feel free to do so and so my email address is there in case you have any questions that you know you don't get a chance to ask or you you know don't get the question to ask afterwards you are also very welcome to reach me so um, in this presentation I'm going to talk about several topics one of which the first one is voluntary use of renewable energy why is this a consumer-led market and here I want to say, you don't have to agree with me, by the way, <laughs> because I'm going to speak from my perspective, you know, from my, you know, vantage point of my, um, you know, experience with the market. And I'm not experienced in all aspects of the market because we are, I'm not a buyer, I'm not a seller. I will talk a bit more about what I do, but briefly, I encourage the buyers to buy, um, more sustainable and more impactful renewable energy and i'm encouraging the sellers to sell such energy so i am not there as a you know um, buyer or seller or a you know policy maker or whatnot myself so i see this as a consumer-led market but previous like i mean prior to this uh, lecture we talked with Stefan about this and he actually for example said the market is becoming more of a seller's market so if you have any questions or comments about that, you know, I would also be very happy to discuss about this with you. Um, so after I give my, you know, impressions about uh, what I think about the voluntary renewable energy uh, market, I will go to the um, tracking. So what do we mean when we say energy tracking? Why is it there? Why is it important? And how do the certificates work? Because we're going to talk about some certificates. So I'm going to um, talk about that. And after that, I'm going to talk about the eco-energy label. So why to bring eco-energy third? Because without talking about tracking, I can't talk about the eco-label. So I do promote the eco-energy eco-label. You know, we are a non-profit eco-label after all. We are nature conservation. Um, however, without telling about the basics of how the market works, I cannot really promote the label. So you could see the label as the icing on the cake, you know, if there is no cake, then I cannot talk about the icing or the decorations on the cake. So that's why the Eco Energy Eco Label is my third point on this presentation. And what does it add to renewable energy purchases? So I'm also going to tell you a little bit about that. And here I also want to highlight what the consumers want, because um, there wouldn't be any point of the Eco Label adding something if the consumers didn't ask for it basically so i'm also going to talk a little bit more about that and um last but not least i'm going to talk about consumer demand and uh sophistication of demand and what it means basically that consumers have you know more sophisticated demands um and why is labeling becoming relevant regulatory wise so i'm also going to uh, touch upon this a little bit too so let's move on so the voluntary use of renewable energy, why is this a consumer-led market? So the consumers have the power, both literally and figuratively, uh, because they are the ones who choose what they want to buy. So you could say, well, there are more pressing needs uh, a consumer has, such as when there is a price signal from the market, consumers would you know, naturally gravitate towards that. And when there is again a price signal or a you know regulatory signal, they would you know uh, divert from that. Yes, this is true. However, it doesn't always go in this order. 
sometimes and more often in emerging markets outside the EU, where I focus the most, um, we see the consumers putting, giving the signal to the market, asking what they ask for. And then the market players go out there to provide them what they are asking for. And after all of this has taken place, the regional local authorities notice the situation. And they say, hey, why don't we get in there too? You know? So only at that point, actually, we start seeing some um, official documents or official steps. Because the governments in you know most of the emerging markets, they don't initiate things themselves. They come only when they see something is already ongoing. So from this perspective, I would say the consumers have a um, huge responsibility too because what they are asking for has the potential, the capacity, the power to guide the market in the direction they are um, uh, taking it to. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that on my upcoming slides as well. And here I put as a bullet point the Paris Agreement, because, I mean, by this time we know that, um, I mean, we don't even call it global warming anymore. This has become a um, climate crisis, this is global heating, and all over the world we are seeing its consequences, and even if we don't see the consequences, they are there. And um, gradually we are getting to the point that they are becoming more and more undeniable. So, um, and we see consumers, and when I say consumers, so sometimes I mean the corporates, you know, the companies, the large energy consumers, but consumers are also ourselves. We are all consumers of some sort. We consume things, we consume products, we consume services. And um, I mean, in our modern lives, it's not really possible to be 100% self-reliant. Of course, self-reliance is very good, but um, how can we be 100% self-reliant? Uh, that is not possible for a large majority of us. So we consume these goods and services. And again, when I say consumers have the power, we have the power too. Because when we go to the market or when we need a um, service, we choose what we want. And often um, what is being offered is more or less the same. Uh, and in these cases, it becomes especially crucial to look at the company and what they are doing. I don't remember the exact number right now, but especially Generation Z and Millennials, which I assume most of us here, um, say that it is important for them that a company has a sustainability policy and they have some climate measure in place. This influences their buying decisions. And um, of course, in some countries or regions, you know, where there are monopoly of some products and services, this may not be an option. But this doesn't mean that people are not asking. This doesn't mean that people don't require this. So when I say consumers, so also include yourselves in this too, because we also have the power to guide the market with our decisions. And um, when Basically, when the consumers ask, so this is what I have mentioned previously, when there is asking, there is someone providing that. Um, because in the market, you know, when there is the demand, so first of all, the suppliers think, hmm, you know, they don't say no. And then they start figuring out ways how to basically make it happen. And this sometimes happened with very large players like Google, IKEA, Microsoft, you know, Sometimes they have given the input, but sometimes it's the bulk of consumers, much smaller than, you know, Googles and Ikeas and Apples and um, those big names. But there is the bulk of them going in a certain direction. Then, you know, this makes a lot of the sellers also start offering what they want. I will give some examples to this in the upcoming slides, but now just to set the scene, let's say, just to give an um, prelude and uh, ouverture of what I'm going to dive deeper uh, later. Um, basically, this is how the market forms. And when I mean the market, I'm talking about voluntary renewable energy use market. Uh, most likely you are familiar with the carbon markets, you know, with the Kyoto Protocol in the 90s um, about carbon emitting. And um, because the idea is that you have no choice, but you emit this much of carbon. 
So you might as well, you know, offset it as much as you can by financing projects that uh, mitigate the, their impacts. But right now we are at a point that there are many ways we can reduce the carbon emission in the first place. So once you can reduce your emissions, for example, by using renewable energy, then the necessity, the need to offset is also decreased. So of course, you will also have some emissions you will need to offset. But still, the idea is that whenever you can avoid emitting in the first place, it makes more sense to avoid it in the first place. And renewable energy is actually one of the, I would say, easiest ways. I'm not saying it's easy to navigate the market. It's becoming complex, but for a good reason. Good reason because it's in the phase of being, you know, transformation. So um, that's why when there is more, you know, stimulus, when there is more dynamism, this is to be expected. This is not to be feared. But basically, since there is a lot of happening in the renewable energy market, it is basically forming. So in the beginning, when I said this is a good time to be involved, um, I was referring to this, actually, because now we see concrete steps being taken, not only talk. And there are also many, like you see in the photo, who are asking for more action, you know, less words, more action. And um, and lastly, you know, I don't maybe even need to say this, but action speaks louder than words. We always know it. And especially in my role at Eco Energy, like I mentioned, I'm uh, encouraging the buyers to buy and the sellers to sell environmentally sustainable and more impactful renewable energy. I notice this more often. I could give a good overview, you know, but still it doesn't really... Um, it doesn't really get to where it needs to get to. But when I give a concrete example, hey, X company is doing it. And especially if this X company is in the same sector, it has a uh, much, you know, quick response. It has a, um, yeah, it has a very quick impact. So actions do speak louder than words. And that's why this is also something I am trying to do as part of the Eco Energy Eco label to encourage the best practices. Because best practices, have the, you know, um, they offer the opportunity, basically, to guide people. It doesn't mean that they have to do the same thing, but they at least see, hey, this is possible. So maybe I should look into this too. Maybe I can do this too. And this basically is a chain reaction. And speaking of chain reaction, I'm also going to talk about this later. But when you talk about a company, let's imagine a um, company headquartered in Germany. It doesn't mean that their operations only affect Germany. They have their supply chain. So the whole value chain basically has, you know, carbon emissions. They use energy for sure. And uh, energy is often an like abstract ingredient. You know, it's not like I produce apple juice, so I buy apples. You know, it's more logical. But of course, there is some energy that goes into that too. So this is often um, taken for granted because we don't really, let's say we, I mean, in Western countries, we don't see the value of reliable electricity connection. Um, when you switch on the light, you know, the light comes, or if you have a production facility, you know, you have your um, electricity connection. But, you know, in many parts of the world, this is not a given. And um, even when it is a given, for example, in Germany, in many European countries, you can choose where your electricity comes from. So when I say consumer has the power, I'm also referring to that. You can choose your supplier. You can choose what you buy from your supplier. And basically, um, this gives you the um, leverage to get what you So if you want to promote renewables, you can go out on the street and do that, or you can simply use renewables. That's also a way of promoting the use of renewables. Because again, you are speaking by your actions, not only with your words. So um, there is, I'm sure most of you know, um, especially among the young generation, there's climate activism that is on the rise. And it is wonderful that they are doing that. But the thing is, we shouldn't wait until they become, you know, the consumers, the procurement managers or, you know, the householders. Um, because right now there are people who can take action. So um, ideally, you know, we convince them to take action.
And um, so now I'm going to talk further about um, those who we should convince to take action. Um, and there are many ways of doing this. For example, the Climate Group and CDP, they are two NGOs. Um, they have started this initiative called the RE100 in uh, 2014, 15, if I'm not mistaken. And at that time, um, the RE100 was a group of 100 companies who promised to use 100% renewables at some point, you know. At that time, um, it wasn't um, basically set, you know, um, in stone in the sense that, you know, okay, we're going to do this by this time and we this is how we are going to achieve it. I and mean, they were saying, okay, we're going to use 100% renewables. And then they started setting their targets. Some of them set 2020. Some of them reached those targets, some of them set 2030, and they are rushing right now to meet, uh, meet their targets. And uh, But by now, so since 2014-15 to now, the number of their members rose tremendously. Now they have, I think, over 300 members, and from all over the world, surprisingly, a lot from Asia-Pacific region. Um, so, I mean, you would expect, or at least I would expect the, them to have more members from Europe because the initiative, um, a lot of the companies who joined in the first place was from the UA, had some Europeans. But yeah, so they had a, a very large number of um, participants, uh, you know, members who joined from Asia Pacific. And here I have on the um, left side corner on the bottom, I have the RE100 report for last year. And uh, basically, they even made the title, you know, we are stepping up in challenging markets because in a lot of Asia-Pacific countries, you don't have a functional, ongoing renewable energy market. Or it is being developed, but, you know, the um, legislative infrastructure doesn't allow for many things to happen. So, um, and another thing I want to highlight here is that RE100 members combined you know, their consumption combined um, is right now, like, has reached the consumption of the United Kingdom. And the UK is the 12th highest consuming country. So every year they, like, they uh, announced one country. I think one of the previous years it was Australia. So this is, this also shows us the, you know, the power of consumers. So, you know, if, all their consumption was combined, it, you know, equals to one whole country. So, um, and this kind of initiative basically created a lot of, um, I would say, maybe even an earthquake in the market because, hey, these consumers are not only talking about it, they are not researching about it, they are not thinking about it, they are not planning about it, they are saying we are doing it. You know, of course, they are doing all those things, planning and risking and all of that. But they are not doing that. They are promising. There is a pledge. And every year they report what they have done towards reaching that pledge. And of course, if, um, you know, a company, and these are, you know, giants, basically, large corporations, maybe some of them we don't even know the names of because we know their brands. We are familiar with the name of the holding sometimes. Uh, so when they make such a decision, it has a huge like ripple effect. So um, it covers their supply chain as well and their you know partners, their competitors too. Um, and this is a very, very powerful message. So that's why I wanted to talk about the RE100 initiative and how fast they have been uh, growing. Here you also see a graph from the report. But if you are interested in this topic, and I think you should be, <laughs> uh, just have a look at the RE100 annual report. Because um, we cannot, like just because it is not a tangible component, we cannot ignore our energy use anymore. And of course, energy efficiency comes first. Of course, the best energy is, you know, the energy you don't consume. But even after all of these, there is still some consumption left. Because when you think about it, our modern lives are really built on energy because we power all our operations. Right now, I'm talking to you through my laptop and I need to connect it to a plug. I need to get the electricity. So, um, and there are ways you know, there are ways we can reduce our impact on nature. 
So it doesn't mean that, okay, let's shut the whole planet down. It doesn't need to be that drastic. There are steps we can take, and there are already those who are taking the steps we can take. So here I again come back to the same point of action speaking louder than words. And here I want to talk about eco-energy because saying actions speak louder than words, and I mentioned um, we encourage taking um, action. Um, maybe I will start by telling a little bit how I became uh, involved in eco-energy. In my first year, I started as a volunteer, as a European Solidarity Corps volunteer. At that time, the project was called European Voluntary Service. And the idea is that, you know, young people get involved in... Um, in projects that you know i mean some of the projects highlight solidarity in you know like democracy or um intergenerational communication and in my case the eco energy project is about you know uh, promoting climate awareness and climate action and this is how i became involved in the eco energy project and then i continued because um of my previous experience in Asia, and I could use those languages to promote renewable energy to some extent. So I focused on those and improved myself on those areas a little bit too. Because um, when we talk about awareness raising, yes, you know, there are a lot of market specific circumstances. But what is really, really powerful is to share the good examples, to share the best practices. And when we see a lot of the NGOs active in this field, be it climate change, be it, you know, campaigning against fossil fuels, we see a lot of negative messages. So you are not good enough, you know, what you do is not enough, or uh, there is this and that. So of course, there is a lot of greenwashing going on too. But it comes to the point that for fear of being blamed of greenwashing, uh, a lot of consumers can't even take action. And um, as eco-energy, we take another direction. So instead of talking about what is not enough, because that paralyzes you. That paralyzes you, and when you are paralyzed, when you cannot take any action, you know, the domino stones don't fall anymore. And that is the chain reaction we want to see. So what we do as eco-energy is that we highlight the positive examples. So no matter how small you have taken one step and that is good because when someone tells that to you today tomorrow you can do more i often give the example because there's a lot of this kind of talk in the sector unfortunately for example you tell me oh i'm going to start exercising i'm going to run 10 minutes a day and if i just laugh at you and say oh 10 minutes a day doesn't mean anything you should run one hour or do you know this and that like olympic athletes they run i don't know how many hours like five hours a day if you can't do that, it doesn't mean anything. Well, this is very discouraging for you because, I mean, you are not an Olympic athlete. You are not preparing for the Olympics and you just want to live a healthier life. So 10 minutes actually is quite good for you. And if you um, feel recognized and acknowledged at this point, it is going to encourage you to run 15 minutes next week. Next month, you're going to run 30 minutes, you know, like gradually you can build on as well but if someone tells you oh running 10 minutes doesn't mean anything then you'll be like okay then i'll just sit you <laughs> know then i won't run at all so when it comes to climate action and especially about renewable energy consumption i want to highlight this too and i give this example of like running 10 minutes and building on because at the end of the day actually before the end of the day <laughs> ideally we really need to put one foot in front of the other if we want to get somewhere. And in this um, instance, Greta Thunberg says, no one is too small, no one, you know, everyone is needed. Uh, no one is too small to take action. And uh, when we highlight the good examples of, you know, consumers, then it encourages others. And I can truly vouch for that because when I am talking to different stakeholders in different countries, be it in Asia, be it in uh, EU's neighboring countries, I can give the example of a very small shop in Finland. And most likely the people who are in that Finnish shop will be like, yeah, but you know, our consumption is quite small. We are not like, you know, uh, Apple or Microsoft, uh, but it still speaks uh, huge volumes. You know, it means really a lot. So we highlight the positive examples. We share the best practices in different languages so that we can reach uh, those people. And uh, we see a huge benefit in that. 
So um, we promote the use of renewable energy and we communicate about environmental commitment and what it means. And we do this, again, I want to say, not by saying renewable energy is bad, you should do more. Using renewables are good, but you can do more. Would you like to know more about that? Would you like to know yeah. how? And more often, uh, we see that uh, it's a lot easier than what people expected it. So as Eco Energy, our mission is also to make it easier for consumers to take action. Good things don't have to be difficult. Of course, if you want to set extra targets, commitments, you're more than welcome, go ahead. But yeah, just because for it to be impactful, it doesn't have to be difficult. And we um, aim that through this encouragement, we will also promote sustainable generation. The Eco Label is not for generation, of renewable energy, but it is for the sales slash consumption. I use this interchangeably because, I mean, nobody buys more than what they consume. So um, the eco label is for the consumption also to underline the fact that the consumer has the power. So it's not the generation facility or it's not the seller, but it's the consumer who makes a choice. And um, by, you know, using our label as a tool, we want to help consumers to find the energy. You know, what is the energy I mean here? The best renewable energy is, first of all, environmentally sustainable. And second of all, when I say brings extra positive impact, what do I mean by that? One of them is the concrete impact so that the renewable energy purchase of the consumer is not only a financial transaction between, let's say, me and my energy supplier, but thanks to my demand, good things happen elsewhere in the world where they are needed the most. Uh, in developing countries, in off-grid villages, usually these are remote places that are difficult to access. Uh, people don't have access to electricity. And when I mentioned um, we often take reliable electricity connection for granted. Uh, this is the case that we don't see its benefits in our lives. So the projects Equenergy finances um, bring like health-related benefits, for example, with like solar panels installed on uh, health clinics rooftops. They can have fridges to store like vaccination or other medicine, and they can have um, lighting or even computers, you know, for doctors to use and keep a track of the patient's history. Um, and um, for example, solar panels on school rooftops can promote lighting or again, the use of computers. And in a lot of the developing countries, children need to work or like herd animals or, you know, help with the farm so they can study in the evenings. So having a simple light um, promotes, you know, education also for children. So energy finances these kind of projects and also we do advocacy work so we um, talk to relevant stakeholders we bring them together we act as a bridge between different parties in the market that maybe won't even sit together on the same table and won't hear each other unfortunately but we try to facilitate this and we bring them together as much as we can and this way they can also hear that, you know, hey, these guys, so we are okay an NGO, but we have a large group of consumers basically behind us. So we amplify their voice when we speak, you know, we speak for them as well. So that also basically makes our voice stronger. And um, so the Eco Label was launched in 2013. And uh, at that time it was only in Europe, so in the beginning, it was only in Finland. We are based in Finland, by the way, but the eco label is available globally. And um, so after 2015, the eco label started being active in other countries as well, outside of Europe. And um, right now, eco energy labeled energy is being used in more than 60 countries. And um, as I mentioned previously, we are a nature conservation initiative. So Ecoenergy is an initiative of the Finnish Association for Nature Conservation. And I can say we are the most international project of Finnish Association for Nature Conservation. And we are always looking to grow and to expand um, the reach of our label. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the boring aspects, you know, the technical aspects of tracking. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, feel free to type or feel free to ask. 
So you see an image here uh, on the left side. Um, so basically the grid is, there is always electricity in the grid and it comes from many different sources in many different locations. So actually it is not possible to track a single electron and see where it is. So when I make an agreement with my supplier, you know, if I buy apples, I can even point to you. I want this apple and I want that apple and I want the one next to it. And you give those apples to me. But when it comes to electricity, I cannot say I want that electron and I want half of an electron and I want currency to, you know, come from this direction or whatnot. Because when it's in the grid, it basically comes from the nearest place. Um, so physical tracking is not possible at this stage. So that's why there is something called book and claim system in the EU. Um, this means just like you would book a hotel room, you know, you can book a table at a restaurant or a hotel room without actually being there and like holding the table in your hands, um, you book it in advance. So in the case of renewable energy, of course, you book it after your consumption because then you know how much you consume. Um, this way, uh, you ensure that no other consumer is going to make any claim based on um, a certain volume of electricity you purchase. And, um, and why is this so? Because this is the most viable alternative at the moment. If tomorrow there is something else that needs to be discussed within the you know, relevant EU bodies, because right now there is a SEN standard process going on, um, and the standard is a you know Europe-wide uh, bureaucratical text. Um, it has taken a few years now already, so that is a you know um, a bureaucratic process, let's say. And um, but before that, there was the EECS, the European Electricity Certification System standard. Uh, it was voluntary, but the SEN standard is becoming mandatory for all EU member states. And um, this system basically means, I mean, the GOs have existed with the EECS system as well. So GO stands for guarantee of origin. And this certificate is like your ID card or your passport. So right now, you know, I am in front of you, speaking in front of you. Um, and if I am physically present there, you would be sure I physically exist. Uh, right now, you don't know whether I am, you know, just half and I don't have, you know, the rest of my body. Um, well, in, I mean, during Corona times, you can never know. Um, but yeah, so if you, if I go to a bank or if I go to an official, you know, uh, place, then they would ask for my ID card or my passport to make sure that I am really me. And what does my ID card say? My name, where I was born, when I was born, my type, let's say, my gender. Um, and in the case of electricity, basically a geo is the, you know, place of birth basically you know where the installation is placed and its capacity and its commissioning date uh etc so it gives this basic information and this geo certificates are used in um, eu and in north america they have RECs, renewable electricity certificate and outside of these places they have irex international RECs, basically international renewable energy certificates and here I don't have on the slide, but there are, there are also national certificates. In Taiwan, for example, they have their T-Rex. In China, they have their GEX, green electricity certificates. And in Mexico, they have their CELS, C-E-L. They have IREX there too. In Turkey, they have their YEC certificate. They have IREX too. So basically national authorities can also start these certificates because these certificates help consumers make a claim saying, you know, in the year of 2021, we have used 100% renewable energy. To communicate that, I need to base my claim on something. And certificates help with that. So here I wrote reliable tracking according to the Greenhouse Gas Scope 2 guidance. The Greenhouse Gas Protocol is a document basically worked on by consumers and other parties in the market. So this is not like a um, bureaucratical text, you know, like some official body government, you know, uh, puts in front of people. But this is worked on, this was worked on in 2013-14 by um, consumers who are in the market because they want to use renewables, right? So, um, and they wanted to find a way, you know, because everybody starts inventing their own thing. Let's say, wait a minute, let's put a standard, you know, let's put some basics. This is how it is done, you know, and how do we want it to be? 
So this is how the greenhouse gas protocol was um, written with a lot of discussions and exchanges of ideas, etc. And um, so when I said a GO, because when I when I have one GO, one GO stands for one megawatt hour of um, production. You know, if I buy it, it covers one megawatt hour of my consumption. Then, for example, Johanna cannot make claims on the same megawatt hour because I have the GO. So that um, generation is cancelled. It's like removed from circulation. So no one else can buy that. And this way I am assured that there's no double counting, meaning basically two entities making claim. So that way I know. And, um, and the you know, criterion of eco energy is that the GO must be redeemed within 12 months. So these certificates, by the way, they have an expiry date, but it's different in different countries because this is a, you know, can be national uh, legislation. Um, so there is that. So just to wrap up this uh, heavy slide a little bit, a uh, tracking certificate helps um, track the use of, uh, track generation and makes it available on a database, the geo database in the case of Europe, so that consumers can, you know, put their hands on that and, you know, make a claim on that. And no one else can buy that certain um, generation. So they are necessary to say that um, I, as a consumer, use uh, renewables. And in the sense, for example, I mean, I use renewables at home. I use eco-energy labeled electricity at home. Uh, but my consumption is maybe I consume one megawatt hour in a year or something. So I don't officially go and buy the certificate, but it is the responsibility of my supplier to have it, you know. Uh, but of course, if I was a larger consumer and I'm doing, let's say, reporting to CDP or GRI or other initiatives, then I would actually need those cancellation statements. So I'm moving on. Um, so here I'm, you know, after I told you about tracking, uh, I can tell about the label too, because the label comes on top. So I mentioned the tracking certificate is like your ID or your passport. The label is more like a diploma, you know, because on your ID card, it doesn't say you play the guitar very well. On your passport, it doesn't say you are a really good cook, you know, or you have, you know, went to a culinary school and got a, you know, um, achievement of some sort. It doesn't say that. But in order to get that achievement, you should have an ID card. If you don't have an ID card, you cannot register to a university and get a diploma or get a um, uh, certificate, you know, training certificate or something. So the eco label is comes on. I mean, it comes on top, like not literally all the time, uh, but it comes on the basis that there is a tracking involved. So the tracking is to make sure that electricity is wind, solar, hydro, you know, what kind of renewable it is. It is to prove that. And the label ensures other things. Um, I will talk about those, but first of all, it also gives visibility. So here on the slide, you see some examples of some of the products in one uh, EV charging port that um, uses eco-energy labeled electricity. And you can either put this as a sticker on a, you know, door, or it can come on the product itself, or it can come on the charging port itself, or it could be, let's say, if it's a hotel, hostel, it can be a small sign and the reception. So um, it basically makes it visible because electricity itself is not a tangible um, product. It's not tangible commodity. So um, basically, the eco label is a visually appealing tool to help consumers to like communicate and to show that um, they use renewables. It speaks, you know, more than uh, what words can explain. When you see the logo, you understand it's about renewables, it's about ecology, some sort, you know, you see a flower there, so that also gives you the idea. The logo is internationally recognized. We protect the logo in different continents. And uh, so when a consumer uses EcoEnergy, they get the right to use our logo in um, their, you know, communications. It can be their text or products. And we provide like photos and texts and um, that kind of thing to the consumers because we want to we want to make them basically talk about it. We want to make them vocal about choosing renewables because this way they can inspire others to do the same. And by others, I don't mean their clients, you know, who like ourselves go in the supermarket and buy those products, but also their competitors, their partners, their supply chains basically um, a whole range of um, network. So here, 
I wrote four main categories of why consumers choose eco-energy labeled energy. And um, so maybe I can start from the end, from the fourth uh, item here, international recognition. So in the beginning, we saw it was usually smaller consumers that showed interest in the label because we were also quite young and new in the market. Like I gave you the example of a small shop in Finland, for example. Um, so we saw interest from them because they wanted to be part of something larger themselves. They wanted to be part of a, you know, movement where their voice will be heard and they would become this, you know, group of consumers who take an extra step. Um, however, especially after 2018, we have seen a lot of interest from the very large corporates. So, um, right now, six RE100 companies are using eco-energy labeled electricity. And the benefit to the larger corporates, the large companies, is that um, when you have several, you know, your operations in several countries and regions, you don't have to look into what is available in each country. Um, eco-energy is... Um, that there are not that many international labels. So in Germany, you have a lot of labels for renewable energy. They are um, national labels, not international. So they are for consumption in Germany only. They have different criteria, just like you have different sources for French fries in Belgium, ketchup and mayonnaise, and not all those boring ones, but like curry ketchup and whatever mayonnaise and all of that. So there are different flavors different uh, tastes basically but that is the case in germany in many other countries there is there are no labels and even if there are there are they are national labels. their materials are only in their language they are only active in their country etc but eco energy is internationally available meaning our text and our materials are available in many languages we have contacts and we are building even more uh, contacts in different countries so as a large multinational you don't have to go you know and look for something different in every place once you choose eco energy you can cover basically over 60 countries um and that also gives you the you know um guarantee that there's a certain standard the renewable energy you buy in europe is of a higher quality but in vietnam is of a lesser quality no if you buy eco energy it's the same quality the same standard you know that and um so the third point here i have is additionality and leadership um well leadership the word in itself if you do what everyone else is doing you are not a leader but to be a leader you need to set a trend in a certain way and this really fits in with the idea of doing something extra going the extra mile um renewable energy is becoming the norm this is something pedro faria from cdp said a couple of years ago now in the current you know situation of you know energy prices and all of that it may not be that um easy to say but it doesn't mean that it is completely on the you know off the shelf either uh it is still the case and um when renewables are becoming more common it becomes more obvious that um more impactful renewable energy is basically what more consumers are after but still when we talk about leadership especially in emerging markets um by paving the way you open the you know possibility to many others too and um this doesn't only have like advertisement value but it also you know means that you are taking the initiative in your hands like let's imagine we are all sitting around the table everyone is looking at each other who is going to make the first move when do i get up at the end i mean eventually someone needs to get up and give the signal that you know others can get up too so this is the leadership part so the eco label helps with this you know the icing on the cake let's say yeah um that you know it brings extra benefits and additionality so this is a very big word and it has uh the joke is that it has as many definitions as there are people um additionality usually in the carbon sector it means that uh, if a power plant a renewable power plant wasn't built there there would have been a coal mine or a fossil fuel so this is new addition so if i didn't demand for it it wouldn't have been there so this is the idea but right now in the electricity sector, a lot of people mean it in the sense that there will be a new power plant built. So let's say IKEA builds their own wind farm. So it is additional to the grid, you know, otherwise it wouldn't be there. Um, 
So that is the idea of additionality. But we see this additional impact. And in 21st century, can we really say, for example, regarding what I have said about the um, carbon sector, can we really say that if I hadn't built this wind farm here, there would have been a coal mine? I mean, how good of an investment is a coal mine right now anyways? You know, all the um, financial supporters are backing off and there are a lot of unoppressed from people as well about the build of new coal mines. And you don't know after 50 years what happens, you know, so how viable an investment it is. Like, that's a question mark anyways. But how we um, want to basically contribute to this is that the projects I mentioned, solar panels on school rooftops, health clinic rooftops, solar powered um, water pumps for drinking water or irrigation water, or um, smart uh, kiosks where people can go and charge their phones or their um, solar powered lanterns and all of that, or a solar powered mill for grinding grains and stuff like that. So these projects bring additional impact that otherwise wouldn't have been there because someone would invest in renewables in Germany but is someone going to invest in, you know, um, Togo? I mean, yes, they will, but, you know, the likelihood uh, is a lot less in, you know, different countries in Africa, in Latin America, in Central Asia. There is a lot less happening. There is huge pressure, but unfortunately, what's happening is a lot less than what it should be. So the number two here is communication. I have mentioned this already several times by putting the logo, you know, consumers can communicate and the sellers can also communicate and say, look, we have this product range, you know, we can fit, um, we can like fulfill your needs, you know, we can uh, find the right product for your taste. So it is communication for both sides. And climate and nature, uh, we have a sustainability criteria. Maybe I can tell you a little bit about this too. The criteria um, has been approved by environmental NGOs from different countries. And in a nutshell, it means, um, for example, the wind farms aren't located on birds migration roads. And uh, the solar panels aren't located on environmentally protected areas. For hydropower, we have stricter criteria. We want the minimum flow to be maintained all in the tributaries, the branches of the river. And we want functional fish passages and we want regular reports about the river habitats. So um, these are basically the um, to minimize the local impact of the um, installation itself. And the difference of eco-energy and other renewables. So I won't talk a lot about this slide, but I just want to mention the fact, like something I mentioned previously, renewables are good, but it can be more, you know, they can be better. So this is our motto. We don't say plain renewables are bad, but what the Equa Energy adds is that the new projects we finance via our climate fund and bioenergy. Yeah, I didn't mention our criteria for bioenergy previously. The material that goes into the facility has to be residues, not able to, like you're not able to use it for some other purposes. So this, of course, obviously leaves the energy crops, etc. You know, the agricultural, the crops that are grown only for the production of energy, it leaves those kind of things out. It leaves the, you know, palm oil from Indonesia out, uh, but only the residues that you can't do anything else with. And um, we finance um, riverbed restoration projects via our environmental fund and our environmental fund um, collects money only through eco-energy labeled hydropower. So this is to mitigate the damage already done by existing hydropower. We don't work with new hydropower. And um, yeah, and eco-energy is 100% renewable. It's not a mix of other things. So here I have listed some of the benefits. So our sustainability criteria um, making it easy for consumers to identify um, that, you know, it is uh, environmentally sustainable energy. Otherwise, you need to go and do the research yourself and, you know, how many are willing to do that, how many have the time or capacity to do that. But the Ecolabel ensures, you know, that to you already. And um, our climate fund projects, the projects we finance, they help us combat energy poverty in the developing countries. 
And the ecolabel is a pragmatic market-based tool. So we are not going and preaching what should be done and what shouldn't be done, but in the given existing structure, what can be done better? How can you take one extra step? That is what we are talking about. And, um, and the companies that use our logo contribute to our visibility. And we have like increasingly larger names. Not all of them are public. A lot of them are confidential, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, in large corporates, it can take a lot of time to take a decision because it needs to go through a lot of, you know, uh, layers within the company. But uh, we hope we will have more larger names also, you know, coming out, let's say, and being vocal about their renewable electricity use, eco-energy labeled energy use. And, you know, by sharing about this, they can also inspire many others. So here, I have a question for you. I originally intended to make this into a Kahoot, but I don't have the um, premium version of Kahoot. So instead, I put the um, question here. Um, so it would be nice like, if you could vote on the Kahoot app, but since um, I don't have it right now, I put the options here. Uh, maybe um, if like you can just write on the chat, you know, like red, blue, green, um, yellow, whatever, uh, on the chat box. So what do you think? What is the necessary instrument to claim renewable energy consumption in the EU? So it would be great if all of you can participate. What is the necessary? OK, oh, the question says necessary, the necessary instrument. Uh, but anyways, you get it. So is it PPAs red? I see a few people writing that. Or is it an agreement with the grid operator, blue? Is it yellow? EACs, such as GEOs, or is it green, uh, allegiance to reporting initiatives? So I will give you actually a couple more seconds. I see some answers already. All of them say PPAs. Um, so please, others as well. I mean, there is no, I mean, there is actually right or wrong answer, but still, I mean, there are no repercussions, let's say. So just put your answer there. What do you think? I see some of you are typing too. Everyone except for Johanna can type. Yeah, someone says PPAs, I think. Yeah, I mean, you don't need to be certain. You can also, like, whatever you think. You can, like, I think it must be this, you know. You can write. I'll give you a couple more seconds. Yeah, you can also write it as, like, yellow, red, blue, or you can write, like, what it is. So far, we have um, the red PPAs. We have um, EACs, which is the yellow EACs, such as GEOs. And so far, that's what we have. Five more seconds. Anyone else who wants to type their answer? Five, four, three, two, one. OK. Answers are closed. So. Uh, let's talk about this because we got like several answers. Um, I want to actually I can briefly talk about blue and green, even though none of you wrote that. So you don't need an agreement with the grid operator to uh, claim renewable energy consumption in the EU because I mentioned what does the grid operator do? I mean, they ensure that there is electricity in the grid, actually. Um, and allegiance to reporting is green. I mean, it would be good if you have allegiance to different reporting initiatives, if you become an RE100 member or whatever. But again, is it necessary? No. Um, so let's talk about PPAs. By the way, a PPA stands for Power Purchase Agreement. And EAC stands for Energy Attribute Certificate, such as yours. Maybe I didn't mention EAC, but GEO Guarantee of Origin uh, I have mentioned. So give you the right answer. The right answer is yellow. EAC such as GEOs. Um, and to those of you who have said uh, red, um, so why do you not need a PPA to claim? So if you have a PPA, so let's see it other way around. If you have a PPA, um, you can claim renewable energy consumption. But then again, um, let's say I walk into a bank and I say, my name is Merve, give me all my money. Then they would say, but how do I know that you are really Merve? You know, you need to give me your, I don't know, bank account number, your ID, your card. You know, I need to prove somehow that I am me, even though I physically 
and present there. So a PPA, if you have the ownership of it, let's say, you know, is indeed yours and it is a wind farm, you can see with your eyes, you know, it is physically present. But in order to make sure that no one else is communicating about it, um, I need to have the passport, you know, the ID. So, and by the way, a PPA is not the only way to purchase renewable electricity. I actually wanted to have a slide on this and I didn't because I thought I could talk about this uh, under this question. Um, the resource platform in Europe is an initiative of Solar Power Europe and Wind Power Europe. And they have coined 14 ways of purchasing renewable energy. And, you know, these 14 methods, some of them are PPAs, like several of them are PPAs. Some of them, you know, is about on-site, off-site, etc. But basically, PPA is only one way of, you know, one of the methods of purchasing renewables. And the most evident way of claiming renewable energy consumption in the EU, um, you just go to your energy supplier and you have a green tariff, let's say. And in Germany, I know it's quite competitive, actually, the companies that offer renewable energy. Some of them offer internet access, some of them offer other things. Um, so in that way, you can actually use renewables. And on your uh, bill, or for example, in Finland, every year I get a, at the end of the year, I get a pie chart, you know, showing like where my electricity came from. Um, but if I, as I said, if I want to, let's say I'm reporting, uh, my, you know, carbon emission and I, you know, am uh, reporting renewable energy use, I would need a geo, a guarantee of origin in Europe. Because even when you make a PPA, you should remove, like you should uh, remove the geos from circulation. So that after I buy it, no one else can buy the same geo. I mean, they can still buy, but not those that I bought. Um, so to wrap this up, PPAs, also have geos that should be cancelled or even if i can't have a ppa i can still make a green tariff i can install on site on my roof and if it's under a certain volume i wouldn't have a geo for it but if it's a very large installation then i would um or i can actually buy the certificates also unbundled it's called unbundled in the market so uh, i won't go into much detail but then the renewable energy and the re its renewable attributes are separated unbundled yeah so um in that sense i can also buy the certificates too but basically yellow is the right answer some of you have given the right answer but red is also a good answer because ppas the power purchase agreements are indeed a method however it is not an option for all the market players though it is being developed uh, in the past, I don't know, three, four years. It has developed quite a lot in Europe. There are different methods, you know, like aggregation, like mm, several consumers can come together and form a joint venture and do a PPA that way. Or, you know, um, they, yeah, I mean, have different agreements, you know, like they can have a colored PPA, for example, then there is a price range. And if it goes above that, then that price is compensated. If it goes below that, then that price is compensated, etc. So PPAs come in different flavors and they are definitely a useful and very versatile tool. But is it an instrument necessary to claim energy consumption, renewable energy consumption in the EU? No. So the second question is coming. Get ready. And I have two questions only. Which one of the following is not a reason? for consumers to choose equal-labeled renewables. So this is about what I have been talking about previously, about eco-energy and eco-labels. So which is, so they are all reasons consumers choose, but which one is not a reason? To make additional positive impact, red. To make their communication activities easier, yellow. To calculate the carbon emissions of energy production, blue to have external non-profit endorsement green so please put your answers there and again you know right wrong it doesn't matter you can also write if you are not sure i'm again giving you some time to think and type
Yes, we are getting some blue answers. Some others are still typing. Please go ahead. Which one is not a reason for consumers to choose equal-labeled renewables? So we had a green answer as well. Most of them are blue. Elena says, if it is between eco-labeled or just labeled renewables, then I would say red, but it depends on the further impacts of the label. Good reasoning, yeah. It depends on the label, that's a good answer. Yeah, someone else says blue. Since we got several answers, I'm giving five more seconds. Rush, if you want to type, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the right answer is blue. Um, but it's also what Elena wrote also makes sense. So I will talk a little bit about that. But then, like, very quickly, to make their communication activities easier, yellow, this is a reason why consumers choose eco-labeled renewables. Because if you buy only renewables, you know, I mean, you can still communicate, but um, having the, you know, endorsement of an external body, an external, preferably non-profit organization, which is uh, option green here, it makes it easier than you have a reliable body behind you. Um, I think someone else had written green because, actually, that is also a good answer, because not all eco-labels are non-profit or they don't mean an external endorsement, especially in Germany. You have a lot of products that sound like eco-labels, basically. But actually the product, like I sell apples, I sell green apples, but I give my green apples such a name that it looks like as if it has an external endorsement, but actually it doesn't have. So there is some reasoning behind the answer green as well. Um, and Leia writes, I assumed blue was a reason to increase the consumers who want to do life cycle assessments or so. Yes, and you were right. Um, the thing is, if you want to calculate the life cycle assessment of your products, then you would choose eco-labeled renewables. But it would make more sense for you to go for some labels based on other, like let's say if you are in textile business, I'm just making up, then you would go for a label for, I don't know, the textile dye you use, or, you know, is the textile you produce 50% cotton, you know, percent something, 30%, then you would want to label those materials. Um, because the life cycle of the product, like, yes, energy is a component there, but then the product itself, and it is li its life cycle, you know, how is the product recycled, for example? how recyclable it is or how you know like is it possible to fix the product or is it one time use you have to throw it away or that kind of thing so eco labeled energy so when we talk about eco labeled energy then energy itself is the product yeah you use the energy to produce some other product but still the label is for the energy itself so it doesn't say much about the life cycle of the product the consumer produces i hope that was clear it is a bit confusing though but red was too obvious, I think, to make additional positive impact, though one of you said depends on the label, that is true. But I would say the idea, like even when you look at the German labels, and I say even when because there are many labels in Germany, um, I mean, why is there a label in the first place to add something, right? So yes, for some labels, for example, the age of the power plant is something but for eco energy it's not unless it's hydropower then we just don't work with new hydropower i mean we don't even have a criteria they're specifying if it's after 2013 we just don't work with it um yeah so for some labels that is a criteria for some it's not and for some there are others you know but uh basically the idea of a label is that it has some extra so i have my id card you know i was born somewhere in some year but, you know, I also have a diploma that, you know, I have graduated from, you know, some program or I have a certificate proving that, say, I play the guitar or I cook, I don't know, Chinese cuisine or, you know, I have carpentry skills or whatnot. So even though the skills themselves can be different, the eco-label itself is like a certificate to prove that. 
But yeah, I don't want to say certificate because then it's easy to confuse with the actual certificate, the EAC, the Energy Attribute Certificate, GO in the case of Europe. Yeah, but thank you very much for your answers. And I like when you write your reasoning as well, like what you had in mind, uh, because it makes sense. And I wrote like some of the and an like answers a bit tricky to mislead you. So, uh, but good. I move on to my next slide. So here I talk a bit about the climate fund, our climate fund. I'm not going to go into much detail, but I mentioned thanks to the demand of the consumers, we finance new projects in developing countries. So this is how we add additionality, because if those consumers hadn't chosen eco energy, these projects wouldn't have found financing from us. Um, and these projects are mostly solar, solar panel installations, and they have like different additional benefits. For example, in Tajikistan, one of the projects we financed is an internet cafe, you know, and there is a computer there and the, you know, local villagers, you know, get internet access, they can write CVs, you know, they can look for jobs and, you know, whatnot. So it gives them basically, it opens a door, a window to the rest of the world because it's a very remote place. And some of the projects I mentioned are solar kiosks or solar powered uh, water pumps. And it helps that, for example, there are these women's collectives there tend their local garden. And it helps, for example, with the irrigation of those, etc. And where does the money come from? It is 10 cents per megawatt hour of eco energy use. And when you think about 10 cents, you know, and I told you, for example, at home, I use one megawatt hour in one year. But so 10 cents is like nothing. But when, you know, the drops come together, it makes up the ocean. Yeah. And I am very proud and happy to say that until uh, 2020, two years ago, um, our overall contribution exceeded a million euros. So when you say 10 cents, it doesn't mean anything. You know, when you say 1,000, 2,000 euros for a large consumer, that is also like 10 cents. But 1 million euro, you can make impact with 1 million euro. Yes, it took us a couple of years to collect that much, but we finance these projects every year. So the, you know, impact increases. And um, I am going to the next slide is about our environmental fund. Like I mentioned, um, our environmental fund is also 10 cents per megawatt hour, but only from eco-energy labeled hydropower. Uh, eco-energy labeled hydropower fulfills eco-energy sustainability criteria. And I mentioned we don't want new dams. And as a matter of fact, some of the environmental fund projects we financed are dam removal projects. Some of them are riverbed restoration projects. Um, one of them is about, for example, a pearl mussel that the populations were decreasing. Actually, they are getting um, slightly endangered. Uh, so there was this university that has taken, you know, some samples. They have cultivated them and they planted them back in the river where the populations, you know, um, increased. So that was very good for the biodiversity, the local biodiversity. And um, yeah, so those kind of projects help with the biodiversity ecosystem, you know, river ecosystems. And um, this is, you know, like I mentioned, as a way to mitigate damage that is already made by humor interference in uh, free flowing rivers. And the reason, I don't know if some of you wanted to ask, like, why don't we work with hydropower built after 2013? It's because we don't need more dams or more hydropower on free flowing rivers. We need more free flowing rivers. If you are interested, there is a recent study, I mean, recent, maybe one or two years old <laughs> of IUCN, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but you can write like freshwater um, living index, freshwater, yeah. If you write living index freshwater, it should come up. In Europe, the uh, freshwater species, their populations are like critically damaged. There is a 90% or 87% decrease or something. I mean, it's unbelievable unbelievable so i'm going on to the next slide yeah so i want to talk more about this i had told you about consumer demand unfortunately i don't have that much time anymore but um yeah i still want to talk a little bit about these so you see different blocks i put them into cubes and these cubes are built on top of each other to um, build up leadership 
So this is already an advanced stage, you know, that you already use renewables, but you want to build on further. So how do you do that? You can think of it as, okay, I play the guitar, but how do I become, you know, a worldwide renowned, you know, how do I become a leader? So um, consumers have different concerns. Like I mentioned, some of the labels, for example, have different criteria about age or about, you know, is it community owned, like ownership? And some of the labels look at the seller themselves um so yeah but still most of these concerns can be categorized under several uh main categories which is basically additional impact you know okay i pay this this is a, i pay for this this is a transaction between me and my supplier but what is extra you know what is the story behind it how can i do more uh so this is basically the main concern and of course like i mentioned there are different definitions so some say it has to be local some say it has to be community owned. Some ask, are there any social benefits for the people living around? Is it newly built? Um, if I commit longer time, then there is like, you know, sustainability in the sense that, you know, time wise sustainability. Some ask for an eco label as a, a external uh, endorsement. Here I wrote, um, yeah, 24 seven, I wrote it the other way around. Some want to say, uh, for example, if you use solar during nighttime or during winter, you know, does solar really cover for that? There are not batteries, you know, they say, you know, it has to be 24 seven. So for some, this is a valid point. Uh, from our perspective, of course, it shouldn't be unsustainable hydropower. I mean, on hydropower, you can have it 24 seven, but are you making damage? So for us, that is a um, bigger concern. So yeah, I mean, there are these different blocks. And again, it's not about arguing which is good, which is bad, which has more impact. And how do you, dear consumer, define that? What are you after? Like I mentioned, the sauces for the French fries. Some people love ketchup, some love mustard. Again, do we need to argue? No, because I mean, okay, in the sense of the source, maybe it's not a big change, but in terms of renewables and climate action, indeed, what you do extra really matters, even if it's a small step. So do what you can. And I mentioned the 100% renewable energy is becoming the new normal, you know, and when the RE100 is out there, I mean, the RE100, meaning those companies who signed up for this initiative became members and they had a pledge they are also encouraged to do more you know by cdp or by their boards you know by their investors as well so there is more like drive let's say in that direction and sophisticated demand guides the market i had mentioned this in my first uh one of my first slides so this these are for example some examples of sophisticated demand if you are hungry you just go to a place and say i want food but now i mean where we we live we say i want this specific dish you know i want it cooked this way with this kind of sauce this kind of seasoning this kind of side dish this is a very sophisticated request but if you are starving you don't think of that you say just give me food i'm dying yeah so we were at that level in terms of renewable energy people are saying oh it's too expensive no i just need energy just give me the cheapest you know whatever fossil or uh, coal or i don't care but right now we are not there now uh, we use renewables, so we ask for healthy food if we go for the food analogy. Um, and there are gourmet consumers, yeah? So for them it matters. For them the story behind it matters. And um, yeah, so basically this is the gap our eco label fills in the market because um, we know the sellers can't always come up with a story, but if they, you know, sell eco labeled energy then you know we have the story anyways we are a nature conservation NGO this is what we promote and um yeah here I wrote again the RE100 and their supply chains I want to leave some time for your question so I'm also going to go over this briefly because I also talked a little bit about that um so when you think of a name let's say a European com company or an American company they say they are 100 percent renewable and you look okay they use renewables in their offices but I mean, that doesn't even make up most of their energy consumption, right? So in that case, of course, they don't say they're 100% renewable, but you get the idea. Basically, a lot of their consumption, and it's their consumption through their supply chains happen in other countries and regions. So these RE100 companies have the, let's say, weight, the substance to draw, you know, to drive, sorry, to drive uh, the markets in those countries. 
because unfortunately or maybe fortunately in especially eastern countries you know outside the us and um, europe it's usually the foreign companies that drive action you know the stimulus in the market when they ask for it then the local players also you know uh start meeting their demands and or they look for ways so basically then there is this activation in the market let's say yeah things start bubbling up and that is a very good stage because then the local uh consumers can also jump on board the local sellers start advertising this is that this is a really like win 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 situation so they can win out of it and our planet also wins out of it because if we have markets you know why not have markets that actually benefit uh that actually help people take climate action but of course this last bit is my personal uh view if you are against free markets or something you are uh, also free to talk about that or ask me anything you may want to ask so lastly I want to talk about sophistication of demand and I kind of regret that I um, can't spend more time on these slides because they these were also um, quite relevant, quite important. But um, okay, so speaking of sophistication of demand, um, why is labeling becoming relevant regulatory wise? So like I mentioned, the eco label is kind of like icing on the cake. And here I'm not talking about the eco energy eco label only. Uh, eco labeling in general so this is basically the result of sophistication of demand because like i said if people just go and they say i want food then you cannot like basically talk about different seasonings because they're just starving so um this is becoming relevant regulatory wise because the eu is also looking for ways to promote the use of renewables and they are looking for ways to promote the sustainable uh the use of sustainable renewables Stefan mentioned in the beginning, like me being a finalist of the EU Sustainable Energy Week Award. So they have this kind of activities as well. So they are looking for ways to promote and to encourage consumer information. And this way they want to encourage consumer action. And this is in the, uh, the second renewable energy directive, the new renewable energy directive. And um, it was written there that the EU, the commission, DGNR, um is going into options about eco labeling energy in europe so long story short they financed a study of german organizations basically uh eco institute and ludwig berkow system technique so they are uh, with trinomics they uh prepared the study you also see a small photo of it i can share the link with you as well it's a hundred something page document um but what i want to talk about here is that the doc i mean according to their study as well, it's very obvious that um, eco, eco label is basically a niche product and its current share in the market is really small, like 1% or 2% or something. So if you want to increase market share of re renewables overall in general, not only eco labels, uh, renewables, you don't do it by dividing the already very small pie then you need to look for ways to reach the others you know who are not buying renewables in the first place or who are not not buying eco labeled energy in the first place right so that's what i why i wrote the second point like voluntary tools versus necessary policy framework the eu i mean the commission dgnr they have the power to um basically set things in stone instead of having a voluntary eco label you know yeah you can have sauce you can have ketchup on your fries but you can also have mayonnaise you know instead of that they can talk about the ways they grow potatoes you know <laughs> um i mean it's a silly example but i hope you understand what i mean so they can for example have more drastic measures to cut subsidies to fossil fuels they could stop advertisement of you know fossil fuel companies they can remove the obstacles in the way for companies for consumers to make ppas in different countries like right now in europe okay eu is a single market but once you have consumption in several countries it becomes a really real challenge so the eu has the power to guide you know to build the road in the first place instead of talking about you know so they can basically help us bake the cake yeah they can bring more cake or they can gather people who can bake the cake instead of talking about the icing and should it be pink or should it be this and should it be that so i hope i was able to explain what i mean but there's also a good example i want to talk about it's you see the photo nordic eco label it's also called the nordic swan eco label 
So this is an example. Governments can encourage further action. So this label was launched by the Nordic Council of Ministers in uh, 1989 or something, I think. And they cover different product categories. So the Nordic Council of Ministers, I mean, the ministers, they didn't um, get there and say, okay, we say it better, we do it better, it needs to be this way. No, they basically developed these like criteria for different products and they support that. So the Nordic Eco Label is actually a good example of that. And in parenthesis, I want to mention for some of their criteria text, they mention Eco Energy as. Um, you know, uh, a label for electricity, you know, used in those sectors. So they don't like reinvent the wheel in that sense, but they're open to cooperation with existing initiatives. And the ministers don't come and say, okay, now, you know, we are going to do it this way and that way in that sense, but they are basically um, going on with the existing market structure and going on with the flow to encourage, yeah, to encourage the use of uh, label. And like, yeah, I wrote, they have, 59 different product groups yes for different product groups there are many of course like different um criteria so yeah i mean um i could talk much more but these are all i wanted to say um at this point so now i can see your by the way you see our social media accounts there you are more than welcome to follow us um feel free to share our posts as well and I see some questions already. Yeah, I see one of them. So I can start reading it right away and answering. Is Equenergy way of handling double counting and other issues transferable on other future labels? Example, water footprint. Is there a way to combine the Equenergy label with other labels? Scope one emission, so on to provide the consumer the whole picture. That's a good question and that's a good reasoning. Uh, but here I want to say like my personal opinion and also my experience in the uh, market. When you want to combine different things, so for, you mentioned water, for example, these are very different expertise areas. And uh, when you want to combine different areas of expertise, you don't come up with harmonized results often. And there are, for example, many different environmental initiatives, Greenpeace, WWF, Finnish Nature Conservation is also one of them, but, you know, a lot less known. So the thing is that we are all doing the same thing. So wouldn't it make sense if we did it all together? Yes. But how practical is it to do it all together? Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. So if we go towards like harmonization in the sense that one label covers many things. You need a lot of different expertise, a larger structure. So for example, Equenergy is still quite a small initiative and it comes with many disadvantages. Also the given disadvantages that we are in Finland, you know, in the corner uh, somewhere in Europe, you know, not in Belgium or not in uh, Germany, where we are close to, I don't know, EU uh, institutions or whatever. So, um, but still, we have the advantage, advantages of it too. The eco label is quite flexible. We are very adaptable to the market. We can hear the consumers. We can hear the sellers. But um, so, is there a way of you know electricity and other other issues like handling them together? There could be, but I don't know if it is as efficient as these are like being done separately. Basically, that's the long story short. And the second question says, how does a medium-sized company, how much does a medium-sized company has to pay to use the Equenergy label? So again, this is not something I can answer because, I mean, not because I don't want to, but because I don't know. <laughs> like I mentioned, we don't sell anything. So at the end of the day, a sales agreement is an agreement between the buyer and the seller. So we can't get in between and say, no, no, sell it for 10 euros. No, sell it for 5 euros. We cannot say that. Um, so the actual end price is determined by the seller and of course what the consumer is willing to pay. So they obviously have a negotiation going on. But what comes to the eco-energy is the only thing we can mandate. And that is 18 euro cents per megawatt hour, 1.8 cents. And I had mentioned 10 cents, if you remember on the slides, that is what goes to the climate fund projects. And the eight cents come to us for our financing so that we, we can continue our activities. We pay rent, we pay salaries of uh, two staff members, etc. 
the moment too. And we have um, European Solidarity Corps volunteers, about like six to eight of them every year. But we also have some extra uh, on their pocket money because Helsinki is an expensive place to live. And we have, for example, the protection of our logo. That is also a, um, a large expense for us. So basically all of that comes from eight cents per megawatt hour. So when you think about it, it's just like peanuts that come from uh, many different sources. But yeah, so I don't know how much a medium sized company needs to pay. But uh, what comes to us is um, 18 cents per megawatt hour of their consumption. Yeah. Are there any other questions? All right. Uh, yes, there's an, an, one other question. Yeah. Um, Johanna, do I have time to answer this? Because I think we have come to the end. Uh, if you have time, yes. Uh, I mean, the students mm -hmm. can leave if they have to, but um, those who have time to stay, they can stay. Mm -hmm. Depends on you. Yeah. Yeah. Then I will uh, give a quick answer. And for those of you who need to leave, thanks for your attention. Yes. Um, yeah. So this question says, does EcoEnergy make sure that the renewable energy farms are built and operated in good labor conditions, especially in countries that have human issues, with which one might not have enough insights to be sure of these things? So this is a very good question indeed, but this is not something we check, unfortunately because um how the farms are built and if there are um human rights violations is a topic that again like see it requires a very different expertise so we are experts in the market so we know the renewable energy market we know about reporting we have our sustainability criteria um but about labor conditions or human rights issues so this is a very different field and honestly speaking i don't know how in here, I mean, clearly it is a big issue. I'm not saying it's not an issue. It is an issue. But is it about the electricity product itself? Or is it about the um, larger issue in that country where, you know, the installation is about labor conditions? Yeah. So it could be that, for example, for clothing, we even um, hear that, you know, is your T-shirt, you know, made by, I don't know, 10-year-olds who are paid like very little money and they get their fingers caught up in the machines. And so it's indeed a horrible thing. And it is indeed like something you think about the product you buy, you know, the, um, the clothing you buy, textiles in this case. But about energy, um, there is just so much when you dive deeper into that. There are about how the land permissions are given, how the, you know, the legal aspects are being taken care of. So in some countries, indeed, there are issues about this. But I would make a, I mean, you can call me optimistic. I would say if there is enough attention paid to the environmental aspects, I would assume that there are no like huge uh, human rights issues aren't going on. But of course, I could be wrong. But unfortunately, yeah, we don't have the capacity to check for that. However, if tomorrow or the day later, it becomes a strong demand from the consumer side, like here you again see consumer uh, having the power, then we could see the market shifting in that direction. Why not? It could be. If it becomes one of the main uh, issues, yes. And it could be. I'm not saying it cannot. So if this is brought up, then you know it will be uh it will have it will have been brought up um one more question is um the annual turnover so um we are a non-profit label so uh all of our turnover is invested in basically our activities i could tell you that um from what well, the last year's data is we are still waiting at the moment but for the previous year, the eco-energy labeled consumption overall was about two and a half terawatt hours. So again, it's actually a big achievement for us. But when you think is, um, I mean, the whole count, I mean, the whole world, it is not a very large number. We are working on that. But again, we are only two people. So I would say uh, don't think in terms of the annual turnover, in terms of the financial income for a nonprofit environmental NGO, but think of the impact. Because, um, again, like I said, um, we are a very small label. We are <laughs> located in Finland. We have only two employees. Um, but still, the impact we have reached, like, for example, we were featured in the uh, first 
SDG Good Practices publication by UN DESA, UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. I see that is a huge achievement. We are mentioned there and they gave us four pages. So um, that is a huge achievement. If I produce these cups, for example, as a for-profit company, that wouldn't have been that much because I could have paid and bought that coverage from a, I don't know, well-known newspaper anyways. But do you see my point? So in our case, um, we are not there to make profit. We are there to invest in impact. So for us, it is about, um, yes, gaining more consumers, but it's also about advancing the topic, basically. Yeah putting sustainability on the agenda of, you know, those who are in the market. So I hope that answered your question and gave you a um, different insight into the topic as well. But yeah, I don't see any questions. And um, yeah, I leave the floor to Johanna then. <laughs> Thank you very much, Merve, for your presentation, for being here today, providing mm -hmm. us with your uh, insights um, to the students. In case there are any follow-up questions, Merve was so kind to sh share her mail address. So you can contact her directly or, uh, as always, you can also send a mail to Stefan or me with any kind of questions. All right. Mm -hmm. So thanks again, Merve. Uh, I wish you all a good day. Stay healthy and see you next week. Yeah, thank, thank you all very much. Have a nice rest of your day.